Hi there. Usually the behavior panel will take a piece of video and we'll chop it up and then we'll talk about what we see in that person's behavior that we're supposed to be analyzing, right? We're not doing that today. What we're going to do today is um, we're talking to two different people, but pretty much at the same time in one section of the video. And this video is long. It's really long. And it's long because we've been really selfish in this. This isn't for the regular old viewer who, who like really likes the kind of stuff we do. That's not what's going on here. What you're going to see here is, a, is an interrogation. And you're going to see, um, we'll ask a question, and then we're going to be quiet. And we're going to sit there. And you're going to get bored watching this. And you get, you're going to get tired of it. And you're going to move on, and that's fine. But I'm telling you ahead of time, that's what's happening. We're trying to elicit information from these two people because we saw them on Unsolved Mysteries, on the Berkshire's UFO uh, incident that's on uh, Netflix. So what, what we wanted to do after watching that, we believed them. We believed what they were saying. As we watched it, I was like, I don't see anything wrong. Greg was like, I don't see anything. Mark said, I don't see anything either. And Chase said, I see nothing. So we did one on uh, Jane Green earlier. And then after that, we, get, we all got an email from this guy named Tom Reed. And he's, and he's the guy that's in, you'll see him in a few minutes if you'll watch this for a second. And he's in, the, he's in the Berkshire's UFO incident on Netflix. And he said, look, I'll talk to you if you want to talk to me about it. So this guy says, look, there's four people who are going to profile me, my body language, and they do it professionally for a living, and I'll go talk to them. And I say I've seen a UFO. So we were like, yeah, we want to talk to you, man. So that's what you're going to see. You're going to see us talk to him and his mother because she was in it as well. And we believed her when we saw it as well. And we talked to them. And you're going to see an interrogation. Again, it's not the kind you see on TV. It's not, where's the girl? Where's the kid? None of that. But this is one form of interrogation. I can't tell you all the details about how we go about doing this. You're, some people who are interrogated will say, yeah, that's, that's normal. But you're going to find it horrifically boring if you're used to seeing or you want to see what we usually do. Okay, just so you know, it's a little long, but it has to be. That's the way, that's the way it is. It, that's, and in the real world, it takes a while to get someone to tell you things and to get information from them, the information you need. So that's what we're going to be doing. It's going to be boring. This isn't what we usually do. And uh, that's why we need to let you know ahead of time that this is different than, than what you're used to seeing. So there you have it. And here we go. <laughs> like I told you, I'm so pale. When I take my shirt off, I'm so pale. You can see my heart like a newborn fish. This haircut makes me look like I'm a 1950s Bible salesman who just walked out of the time. Well, you know how to. You know how to cut. Amber did that. Fresh. Okay. I just cut mine. So, okay. Good. Hey Chase, take a big hit off that and blow it out and go. Welcome to the behavior panel. <laughs> no, because no, you're, you're going to record it and put it into some. Video. <laughs> no, it would be for us. Totally be for us. No, just take a big hit off and go, welcome, I'm Chase Hughes. This is the behavior panel. Here we go. I'm Scott Rasmus, a body language expert and analyst. I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I'm also a trial consultant. Chase? Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I teach behavior profiling and interrogation, also develop tactics and techniques for our intelligence agencies. And I've written a number one best-selling book on nonverbal communication. Mark? Mark Bowden, expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they speak. I've written four books on human behavior and body language. Greg. I currently am a former Army interrogator, Army interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written a few books on body language and behavior, and I primarily spend my time with Wall Street and corporate America today. Now, usually what we do is we have a video, we analyze it, and we tell you the body, body language we see. And we did one on Jane Green when we, after we watched the uh, Unsolved Mysteries uh, Berkshire's UFO uh, incident. After we did that, after we put that one out, we, got, we all got an email from Tom Reed. And he's the guy that's on the, the covered bridge out there on, on the show that, that tells what, what was going on during that. And so we talked to him, and he's going to be our guest today. So, Greg, why don't you introduce Tom and tell us a little about what we're gonna, how we're going to approach this today. 
Yeah, so Tom and I have had a few conversations, and Tom Reed is going to be our guest today. He was, when he was nine years old, if I recall correctly, Tom, was one of the people in this show, this Unsolved Mysteries show, and he was with his mother and his brother and his grandmother traveling across a bridge, and we won't take any thunder from what he's going to tell you. The way we're going to approach this is we're going to listen to Tom's story, ask a few questions as we go, and hear all the details and facts that Tom has to share with us. And his mother, Nancy, is Nancy correct? Nancy, yeah. Yeah. His mother may join us for a few minutes as well. Okay, so thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. I'll let you introduce yourself, and then I'll just get you started. So, Tom, please introduce yourself. Okay. Um, well, I uh, I grew up in uh, Berkshires, Southern Berkshires, um, until I was about um, about uh, eighteen years old. Um, my mother had a diner in town, which um, is now renowned in the in the area, and I grew up with horses. And uh, I uh, funny thing is, when I had the horses, I wanted to dirt bike or a mini bike. And then I ended up getting the dirt bike and I wanted the horses back. So it's, it's never greener on the other side. You know, Tom, you and I shared a horse thing. We said yesterday, yeah. it's, the only problem with the horse is they eat when you're sleeping, you know, that's, that's right. Exactly. So, so tell so, me um, about your, yeah, so, was that a horse when this thing happened to you? Tell me a little bit about that horse. Let folks get to know who you are and what you did with your horse and that kind of stuff. Just oh, make when, I, when I almost fell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I was riding um, at a horse show, a 4-H horse show in uh, Great Barrington, which is, uh, was held at uh, Ski Butternut. And, uh, yeah, I was, um, probably, uh, I was nine and, uh, we were using a, a horse that I wasn't used to riding. It was a, a larger horse. And, um, when I put the saddle on it, apparently it was gassy or whatever. So the stomach was a little bigger than normal. And, uh, I was in a competition and I was going full speed I and mean, I had the thing in a full gallop. And all of a sudden the saddle started to slide to the, off to the side of the horse. I'm grabbing the mane because I'm like, this, <laughs> you know, I couldn't even stop the horse. And uh, there must have been 20 or 30 other horses. And I was somewhat up front, you know, the better part of it. And, um, yeah, by, by the time um, I just felt these hands grab me and, and slide it back up and took me out of the, out of the race, um, you know, that, that was why we left Ski Butternut and started heading home that night that we, we saw this. Uh, we were involved in what we were. And, um, yeah, that uh, scared me quite a bit. I w didn't go on a horse for a while after that. I mean, I was actually shook up from that. But... Uh, so uh, with, with what um, happened back in, in Sheffield, I, I wanted a camera. My mother was like, what do you want for you know, your birthday or Christmas or whatever it was? And um, I told her I wanted a camera. And um, because if we ever saw this thing again, I was going to get a picture of it. And so my mother got me one of those little Polaroids. We had to wait three minutes and you pulled the thing out and you watched, you know, um, you ripped the paper off of it and da-da. And, uh, and so that was kind of what, believe it or not, um, fueled my career because I got into the photography club and great parents sure. high school. And then I started shooting fashion runway in Hartford. And then, um, I became a stage manager for uh, Northeast concerts and I was working with some bands, uh, John Kay from Steppenwolf. And, um, and then I started shooting for Sage Allen fashion shows, you know, Sage Allen, you know, uh, was a store of that in, in the New England area. And, um, I met, uh, Daniel Gallo, who was, uh, with penthouse form in New York city. And I was trained on uh, slide film and studio lighting. And, uh, so then I went to Miami and, and, and over, uh, probably about five or six years of shooting for other agencies. I opened up my own agency and it was quite successful. And I had the five year packaging campaign for Love's diapers. And I was working on a lot of, uh, staffing a lot of the, um, girls and TV shows like CSI Miami. And I became a, the, one of the booking agents for the Miami dolphins and had season tickets to that. So, Miami was kind of more my home than anywhere else until uh, about 2006 when um, I decided to uh, get a fresh start and, and move over to the Tennessee area, which to me was more of a, a warmer New England. So it kind of felt more at home and that's kind of why I'm here. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for the introduction. Get to know you a little bit. Everybody here will have a different thing. So I'd like to shift gears then. Let's talk a little bit about the incident in 1969. And rather than me say, and then what, and then what, and then what, but let's just let you tell us about that night because you, this happened after your horse show incident, I think, correct? Yeah, we, uh, we had left Ski Butternut and uh, we were heading to, um, well, we were actually going to a place called the Meadows for Bite Deep. And um, rather than our diner, because my mother didn't want to cook, and the diner was actually somewhat closed at that point. And uh, so we had a, a burger, and um, it was uh, probably uh, about 8.30 or so. And my mother said, well, let's go back to the diner and close up. And she had to make a night deposit drop and that kind of thing, put the chairs up for the next morning and get it ready. 
And um, so we pulled into the back, actually, near the dumpster. We came in the back door. And um, I was sitting on the, the stool, and my mother was uh, was uh, working on the cash cash register. My grandmother was um, helping, um, you know, put the chairs up. And and we, were, we weren't there that long, but uh, enough that um, it was getting dark. And so my mother went next door to the bank and dropped uh, the money in the slot. It was a bank. It's still in Sheffield to this day. And we started to head home and uh, we got in the station wagon and we were pulling out of the, the, the green there and went up about a mile or so and went, took a shortcut over the bridge. Was that unusual for you to take a shortcut across the bridge? Um, yeah, we normally went down Kellogg. You know, I don't know why we, she went that way. I know she, she really liked the, uh, the drive, but it was too dark to really see anything anyway. Um, but we did. We took a shortcut. And, you know, it was, it's very New England, the bridge, the old club. I don't know, maybe because I was almost trampled that day, <laughs> you know, maybe, I don't know, she was just feeling a little bit differently. I can't, I don't know why we went that way. And, um, but anyway, we came into the bridge and the headlights, the way the headlights were reflecting with the boards and everything, my grandmother had later on mentioned that she saw what she thought was a different bleed of light coming through the boards, uh, the planks at the bottom of the bridge. And, um, but that was something she mentioned afterwards. And as we came out the other side, um, you know, I've mentioned a million times, I was giving my, my brother a candy, which caused my grandmother to turn around and look in our direction. And, um, and that's when we saw what looked like a, a white sphere. It was just, uh, I'm guessing maybe four times the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. And it was solid. And, uh, so when you say you saw it, where exactly in relation to you, did you see that? It was basically right out my window. It was right there. I mean, it was a time we were driving forward. So yes, of course we, it went to the back, but I saw it like within probably 50 yards from where it was. And, you know, I've mentioned that, you know, that it looked like it was coming from the water or the banks of the water. I don't really know where it came from, but when I saw it, it was rising up a little bit and started to go behind a tree line. And we, we my mother kept, driving forward and my brother had looked to the right and saw something that looked very similar but orange in color and uh, so she drove a little further down the road and she pulled off to a near a telephone pole and how, how far do you think she drove oh maybe uh 30 yards 40 yards to the clearing just the other side of the trees did you hear anything no i didn't hear anything any burning scent smell anything else no, nothing. Just it was it, it was quiet. I mean, we matter of fact, it was almost dead quiet. It was almost too quiet. Okay. Didn't hear anything? You know, I mean, it was like I've mentioned. It was like being underwater. It was just like muffled, and uh, and you would have thought you would have heard something. You would have heard birds. You would have heard something. Nothing. I mean, it was dead silent. And I could I was looking at this thing while it was dead silent, and it was just like. And as crazy as it sounds, it seems like once we came out the other side of that bridge, things were changed. I mean, the atmosphere, the everything was just different. Just were you all talking to each other during this while, while that weird feeling really was happening? To be honest with you, I don't remember, but I'm sure we were because it was hot. The windows were open. Uh, my brother was sitting next to me. It was late. I almost got trampled. I had a, a, a green ribbon and a brown ribbon, which I was pretty upset about. And, uh, and so I'm sure we were, but it, we were also tired. Um, I, I can't really remember, but I can't imagine we weren't, you know? Um, but I do remember just nothing, nothing. And, uh, and just seeing this thing. And as I said, my mother pulled off to the right and, uh, we looked out the window and, and, uh, there it was. I mean, it looked like a turtle shell. I mean, it really to me looked like a turtle shell. It had, um, different it looked to have different lines or patterns to it. And the right side of it was a different shade than the left. The right seemed to have like goldish tints or uh, like a pewter or a bronze coloring to it. It was not one solid color. It didn't come to a point. It had a big band around the front of it. Almost, it looked, it's, it looked like a snake. As if it looked like a snake skin around the middle of it, like a tire. And it was very, it was fat, it was wide. So the top was very, small from the top up and smaller from the top down. The middle was the fatter part of it. 
and we looked at it. I'm, everything kind of went, uh, um, you know, from quiet. I remember um, I've talked about little sounds of stones tapping underneath the fender wall of the cars. We came to a stop. Um, after that, um, everything seemed somewhat muted. Uh, then there was the car lit up. There was an eruption of crickets and frogs and cadians. And, uh, yeah. Did you leave the car or were you in the car the whole time? No, I stayed in the car. I mean, as far as I know, um, it was, uh, it was a powerful night, man. Um, but, uh, we were pretty shaken about, uh, for, for a long time, we were very shaken about that, you know, but I also have weird memories of, um, you know, that night of things that I saw or, or recall or, which are very difficult to talk about. I don't talk about it for a lot of reasons. I try to stay very palatable. Um, but uh, there were a lot of things that we came back with that night. I do remember being in what looked like a large um, uh, open area, like a Walmart, if you were empty at a Walmart, you know, just empty. Um, big open area, which was much larger than what we saw. And that's why I say to people, you know, people say to me, you know, uh, were, you, were you on a craft? I'm like, no. You know, I, I don't think I was. I mean, I, I've never said that I was. Um, I was somewhere. We were extracted from the vehicle. All four of us were remember different clips and moments or fragmented memory of what happened. Um, but, um, you know, we, uh, we don't know where we were. Um, a lot of time went by when we found ourselves back in the vehicle. My grandmother was now in the driver's seat. The car was off. We didn't shut the car off. When my mother stopped that car, it was running and the lights were on. You know, we didn't ever, she never shut the car off and we just sat there and looked at this thing. It was running. And um, so my grandmother found herself in the driver's seat. She goes down a dirt road. She turned around and went back to town because we're only a mile from town where our house was about seven miles from there. And she went back for help. And we had no idea, or she at the time had no idea how much time had passed. And so she went into silks when she got out of the car. Um, she believes the car door slammed, which woke me, which was something else. We all came to at different times. You know, I was the second one to wake up from this thing. My brother's head was on my leg. Um, my mother was out. She wasn't responding. So I followed my grandmother into silks. So we went in the front door. She went right past the, the clerk. And um, and she went to the back of the, she went, went right back to the back of the store and got like caught up in these bikes and strollers and things that were in there. I'm grabbing her hand saying, Nana, Nana, I remember that. And um, the, the clerk, you know, was looking at my grandmother. She stopped for a minute. I don't remember everything, but, but um, she never really asked for help for anything. And we went back outside. My mother was standing in front of the car. So your grandmother drove after when she, when you came back to your grandmother was in that seat and she's the one who drove away. When, I'm sorry, when we when drove to Silks? Yeah. Yeah, she drove. My grandmother, my mother was driving originally, and after the incident, my grandmother was in the driver's seat. Which is another thing to me, speaks of human error, which is hard for me to get my head around. This is why it's so confusing. Right. So when you went into the store, when you, the Silks place, what time of the night was it? Uh... It was just before they were closing, probably quarter of 11. Okay. And I don't know silks. I'm assuming it's some kind of a department store or something like that. No, it's a little mom and pop shop. Okay. And so what exactly, when you went in the door, who was there? Who was still there? Just uh, a guy, guy running it. Um, one of the owners probably. Okay. And your, your grandmother just went in and how she, you were saying she got tangled up in something. Yeah, exactly. she walked in the front door and I, she walked right to the back of the store right to the back. So when you, when you were, and, and guys, you're welcome to chime in here as we go, but when you're, when you were stopped and you had all of this encounter, where were you in the car? Which, okay, you cut where out were you sitting in the car? Yeah, where, where were you sitting in the car? I was behind the driver's seat. Okay. And my brother was to my right and my grandmother was to the in front of my brother and my mother was driving. And when you came back, the first thing you remember when you, when you first remember, I assume it was already left the space. Yeah. We were already back at silks. My grandmother was already out of the car. So she was the only one awake. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you're back at silks. Did you start? How, how could well, silk, you... silk store is 
you know, you could hit silks from our diner with a Frisbee. Small town. I mean, it's right there. Yeah. I mean, okay. okay. I didn't know. It sounds like you'd been there twice. I didn't get that part of it. So let me, let me ask you this. So there. when you, when you were in this, this thing that seemed like a, a building that wasn't a spaceship or whatever, did you see these, the other people with you? Did you see them or anyone else in there? And that's a, a good question too, because I, um, like I said, I've got little memories of things. Um, I, uh, I remember hearing voices. I remember hearing my mother's voice crying or, you know, calling out for me, I've, I've said, but then again, I can't swear it was her voice, but I do remember hearing voices. Um, While you I, stood there? Yeah, actually I was sitting. Um, in a chair or just on the floor? Yeah, I was sitting on something um, that was fairly low to the floor. Um, I had, uh, this is where it gets really confusing for me. It's hard for me to digest because it sounds so bizarre. Um, but, uh, you know, I can't help the memories. I can't, it's been with me my whole life. And what I remember seeing, I've never seen before. I never saw it beforehand. I never saw it afterwards. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I remember things vividly and we all do, you know, and that's what makes it so tough. But do I remember, um, I remember markings on a floor like swirl marks. I remember hearing my mother's voices. I remember um, seeing uh, uh, we weren't alone there. Um, you know, I remember that like very well. Do you, so when, when you're, you're talking about the space that you were in that you didn't think looked like a craft or, or whatever. It was like a building. Mm -hmm. Smells, sounds, sights, anything you remember. What do you remember about it? I remember seeing a wall that looked glass. It kind of bowed like a coffee can. It was rounded. Um, I remember uh, very tall hallways. Uh, How tall? Well, again, I was small, but um, I'm going to guess uh, maybe 10 to 12 feet high. Were you walking down the hallways or you just saw them from where you no, were? I was grabbed by my left arm and I was kind of not nicely brought from one spot to another. It was very abrupt. They and drug you? I don't know. I mean, uh, they dra they were dragging you is what I mean? Yeah, I was grabbed by my left arm and the, whoever the individual was, was somewhat behind me and moving me forward like this and took me out a door. Um, I remember going to the right, took me down a hallway. And when I got to the end of the hallway, I was it went left again and um, I was brought into a room. So were there, were there bricks on the walls or was it just one color wall or? No, it was all just white. Everything looked white to me. So there was I, no I light? Saw, I, did see some, I did see a couple lights in a ceiling where the ceiling met the wall. It almost looked like a fluorescent tube. I remember some carts that reminded me of what we used to put our projector on in, in Sheffield Center School. So it was kind of a, a lot of carts, empty space, singular tube lights. Um, very oh, big. Nothing super. Oh, I got a, a question for you. So you know, you know how, and you'll know this, if you get nudged by a horse, you can really feel that it was a horse that nudged you rather than a human being. Yeah, mm -hmm. like they feel they have a different rhythm. Mm -hmm. When you were being moved, what did it feel like was moving you? It, it felt, uh, I was grabbed hard, it hurt. By what, what grabbed you? It's, uh, again, you know, um, I, I'd like to say a, a, a person, you know, um, an individual. Um, Did it feel like, like a human hand? Oh, it was, yeah, but it was, it was hard. It, it, it was like around my whole arm. So, um, and it was dark. It was dark in that particular area until I went out in the hallway. Um, you know, the whole, the whole thing is very difficult um, to really put myself there again, you know. Um, but I can, the area or the spot that where I was grabbed, where these carts were, reminded me a lot of an airplane hangar. And my mother and father were pilots, so that's kind of, I got to, this is how I put it together, you know. Um, it did remind me of an airplane hangar. But when I was taken out the other side and through this door and I was abruptly, you know, uh, removed, if you will, um, that hurt. Um, I don't remember seeing the person for whatever reason. Um, I just 
I remember being nervous, being scared. I remember being escorted and, um, and taken from one spot to another. And so when you, when you went through the door, did the door open? Did you open the door or was there a, a door? Open. No, it was just open. It was a very, it was, uh, it was a, a pretty wide door, I guess, all, all things considered. But it you wasn't know, the kind that does, that does this number where it swings open? I don't open. remember, to be honest with you, I don't remember seeing, I, I don't remember seeing the door. I remember seeing an, an opening and that's where I was taken out. So when you when you went through the door and you said there's a hall, where did you go? I mean, when you let's assume the door's in front of you. When you went into the hall, where did you go next? Well, I was escorted. Okay, okay. I was not. I right, was left straight. I I went straight and then to the right, and then we went down. Maybe I say we, um, maybe uh, fifteen to twenty feet. An immediate left. No no angled cornered stuff. It was lefts and rights it was very sharp okay and it wasn't like high tech that's another thing that's confusing so when i got to the end i was taken to the left and we were taken into a room and the room i was taken into had a, a very bowed in glass looking area um when you say we who do you mean whoever escorted me okay so okay so then when you went to the room with the bowed glass what happened there i was sat on a table um and I was staring at the Glaston wall, and I, um, and this is something else too, because one minute I'll go from feeling, or at least remembering, I was sitting there, I was cooperating, I was, I was whatever, and then all of a sudden I ran. So I think I went from feeling very nervous to, uh, you know, calm to, to scared to my, I think my feelings were all over the place. And I think that's probably one of the reasons I remember it because it was emotional to me. But I ran. I actually ran out the side of this, this room into a hallway. And that's when I walked into this, you know, large area and I had no idea where to go. And I was grabbed again and I was brought back in. I mean, that's as crazy as that freaking sounds. So that's, that's what happened. You know, I don't know why. I don't know what caused it. I don't know where I was. But, you know, that's what happened. So when the cricket started... When the, um, did that start when the um, – did it start slowly? It was like a switch coming on or did they I gradually like, start? Like someone had – we came out the bridge. It was like someone had flipped the switch off on life itself. Everything was muted except for a tapping sound, which sounded like stones underneath their car. Um, and then lit up and boom, everything just seemed to come to life again. How far away was that, other, that orange thing from you when it, when it started? How, how, how far away was that? Um, 80 yards, a little less than a football field. Actually, about a football field. And yeah. it was a lot smaller? It looked smaller, yeah. And it was over the water. Everything was over water. The craft was over some water. The, the big white sphere was over water. And the orange one was over. It was all three were over water. What did, what did you all say when you first saw these, these objects? You know, my, my recollection... I just remember being fixated and staring at it, just locked on it, you know? Excuse me. Um, it was, uh, you know, to see this thing move and, and to, and then stop uh, and, uh, and, and to, to witness something like that and, and to be part of that and just, you know, you're sitting there, what is it, what is it? And at the same time, you kind of know maybe what it is a little bit, but you're, it's, and then it just moves the way it do, does. And you're like, you, you know, you can't take your eyes off it. And what did you say after all of this when, when people were waking up and, you know, what do you, what do you remember as the first thing that anybody said, you said, or anybody said to you? Honestly, I don't remember. I don't, I think that we were all just, fixated and, and locked on, on, on what was happening. My brother was the one turning his head. My brother was the one going back and forth um, for a moment there, you know, because um, for whatever reason, he, he something caught his attention off to the right, which was that orange ball. Um, but for me, I was, I was actually at the time, I was looking for the white, that white sphere. Um, and it was really, I, I think it was my mother that saw the craft first, but the thing about the craft too, the disc, it wasn't like it was hidden that well. It was night, right? I mean, it was like, it was dark, but you could see it. So it was like the shell kind of had a, a sheen to it. There was a light underneath it. 
Um, the white ball, you couldn't you couldn't miss that. Uh, really after actually, all of this, I after, after what, all of these uh, events, what was the first thing that you heard somebody say? I don't remember anyone saying anything. I remember the next, next thing I remember was going into the silks. And I was calling my grandmother. I was grabbing her hand. And she wasn't responding to me. The best of my recollection. She didn't even talk to the clerk. And she went in there to talk to the clerk. And she walked right by him and walked right to the back of the store. How do you know she was going to talk to the clerk? What did she say? I'm going to go talk to this guy? She said that she went back for help. And then we're talking the next day. We're, you know, because we went to the diner. We, went, we opened up in the morning. And, uh, and we've talked about this our whole, our whole lives, right? Well, she went back to Silks for help because no one in the car was responding. And, uh, and the guy never came out. There was no paramedics. There was no officer. And we just drove home. I don't think any one of us were thinking clearly. It seemed to me like, and my brother has said this, that, you know, he, to him, he feels that we were, it was like a sodium pentothal or some medication or something that, that, you know, something got into our system, you know, and that's why we all came out of this at a different time. Because if you ask a lot of other people who had instances or what have you, they're like, oh, this whole thing was like, you know, one minute we're there, one minute we're here. It wasn't like that for us at all. It was almost like we were drugged. How much time passed between the bridge and when you first remember? Well, we got back to Silks before 11. So they were closing at 11 and we left the diner probably 8.30 or so. It was okay. just dusk. Yeah. So when you were in these rooms, you felt something grab your arm. Did you see anything, any person, any kind of a person in that entire time? Yeah, I saw, <laughs> I saw something quite disturbing, you know. Um, so I, you know, I don't know why. Yeah, um, it uh, looked like a bug or an ant to me with a, a large football-shaped head, which is not something I talk too much about because, you know, there's no point. Well, and I, I think the way your memory works at that age, you're going to remember things a certain way for sure. But as much as you're willing to share with us there, we're certainly willing to listen. And I appreciate it, Tom. I know that could be disturbing. Yeah, all right. I saw something that looked, uh, it wasn't human, you know, and I've said to myself, well, was it robotic? Was it, was it um, you know, um, genetically engineered? Is it... You know, we've had a lot of species on the planet. I keep saying we've got 8 million species. What's in one, 8 million and one? You know, I've tried to justify what we saw. I've tried to play with it. I've tried to make sense of it. I've struggled with it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I saw something that um, was quite troubling. Was it tall? Short? I mean, it was like four and a half, five feet tall. I mean, it was bigger than me. Um, it looked like a bug. It had a head like a football. And it had... Um, stick like legs like bamboo when I was in Florida I, you know we had uh, you know some bamboo and I was like oh, that's what the legs look like to me and uh, I've had it sketched and I've it hangs in Roswell but um, I certainly avoid talking about that because it's probably the, the only thing I cannot actually you know validate in some way and and, um, and then again you know we thought well maybe you know there were magnetic anomalies maybe you know with our vehicle maybe there was some our neurons in our head were affected you know i i struggle with why i remember these things why i saw these things um you know is it was it clear conscious memory was my mind infected by what we saw because there were three moving parts so we were in the middle of all these three moving parts there was a craft there was one on the right one on the left so if there was some type of a, a magnetic anomaly you know maybe that's why i um, have the thoughts I do or the, the visions that I do or, you know, could it have been manipulated? But did it ever happen? You know, did, did, you know, I don't know. Have you had an MRI since that happened? Uh, yeah, actually I have. Did you find, did they find anything that? No, no, my son did too, actually, but not that it mattered. He wasn't there anyway, but, um, yeah, we've, you know, we've, um, that I was a car wreck in 2006 do you, do you remember the color do you remember the color of the of those of the bug do you remember what color it was yeah it was how like, many colors was it it was like a, a mushroom color with a like a orangey head so the football shape it was like this this way or was it like this way like a sideways football? like you're holding the football it was just like 
you know, uh, uh, and if the head was bigger than a football. Um, so the points came out here on the end like that? It would go like this or it go yeah, like this? The neck and the stem went up the middle of it and it had very stick-like arms and legs and the body of it kind of came to a, like a, like a teardrop. And uh, that's what I remember. Did it communicate so in any way? Talk to you? No, no. I just saw it. I saw two of them, actually. They were facing a wall. Their heads were almost into the wall. Did they move? Did they have eyes? Or what did their eyes look like? Like round, just round, like uh, marbles. So let me, let me just get this straight. So if it's a football, was it like this? Or was it like oh, this? No, like, like the tip. Like the mouth would have been at the tip and the... In the eyes. So it's sideways, in other words, like straight on football. Not not point not point up here and point up here, but points on the side. You know what I mean? Yeah, so like that, if I was holding the football like, like this, going to throw yeah. you the ball, the face would have been right there. Oh, yeah. okay, I got you. That's the, like I said, this is the one area that I, I struggle with because it's like my – So it's not, the, it's not the big almond-shaped eyes or anything like that? Just no, I didn't see it. That. No, no. What did their hands look like? Did you see those? You know, I've I've tried to fill in some things that what I might what it might have looked like. So, to be honest with you, I I don't really remember a lot of detail. I remember the, the fear of it. I remember sketching it. I remember I I drew it and hung up hung on my class. I'm sorry, on a chalkboard in one of the classes I was in in fourth grade. And a lot of other kids were drawing stuff too. And mine was the only one that you know was a of something very different. You know. Um, no and, sound? It didn't make a sound or did it make a sound? Nope. I don't remember that. You know, there's my brother seems to think that there was a rhythmic feeling, something like that. Um, I don't really remember that too much. But um, then again, we've all collectively talked about this our whole lives. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things. I, we, my brother remembers – like I do being on a table somewhere, but we don't talk about that either because it sounds so freaking, you know, tabloid. So, so in, in, a, in a document that, that you have, Massachusetts State document, they call it an off-world incident. What do you think they mean by that? Well, it's funny because even now we're, we're seeing the off-world, um, that verbiage used in the and the Pentagon statements now. And so I, uh, I don't think the governor or the state wanted to run with UFO. Um, so I thought maybe, maybe that term is something that's a little more palatable to them or something that maybe NASA's using or Bigelow Aerospace, wherever, whoever's working on this stuff, all those rockets or whatever, um, spacecraft. I, I think it's a more um, readily uh, used term than UFO. I think UFO is kind of tabloid anyway. But off-world, I don't think that they had any idea where it came from or what it was. Um, there were, obviously, when you've got this ball of light, and that's what I remember more than anything was this ball of light, um, you know, and it, the way it just moved. Um, what do you think it was? was what do you think it was? was? Well, I, you know, my my thinking, I, I believe that, um, and I've – you know, and I struggle with this a lot because I am a really grounded person, okay? So, you know, I really have a hard time with some of this, but um, it is what it is, right? Um, I think that, and this is now, you know, going, you know, looking at it, you know, um, the Housatonic River was some of the most polluted water in, 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 a, in America. Uh, it was so toxic. People were... Um, fishing out of there, dogs drinking the water, the corn grows at an enormous height there. Um, there's something wrong with that water. There's something, and uh, there always has been, and I think anybody who, who knows the area knows it's a very toxic area. And these things are all over water. You know, the ball was over water, the yard was over water, the craft was over water. Um, there seems to be a connection to water. So I think whatever these cylinders were, had something to do with possibly drawing water, uh, testing water, extracting some water, had something to do with water, you know? And, um, and I think that they were working in conjunction with the, the disc that was 
we saw further on down the road. Um, they're much smaller. I mean, the disc itself was like a, a hundred yards or so. It was huge. And then again, I was smaller. Everything seems bigger, but I spoke with the Jan Green, and she kind of remembers it the same way. Um, there, uh, nothing was really moving too quickly. Everything was kind of moving at a slower pace. But, but then again, I think we were moving at a slower pace too. Um, everything was muted. Um, was was what we remember really happening in real time? Was it not happening in real time? I mean, there's so many friggin' things to think about. You know what I mean? What, you, what about you, those there? those things that were shooting off those rods you talked about? Now, now that there was uh, only I believe two, but when the thing rose up, there was like like rods that came down, and they weren't from the bottom of it. They were like from the sides of it, and it just like poles, like really direct poles, and it was just for a moment or two, and then I've said, "Well, maybe the you know, did I see a reflection? Was it was it a reflection of this thing off the water? You know, um, the windows were open; it wasn't gleam off the window, you know. But there was again, there's water, there's light. My grandmother said there was a bleed of light earlier underneath the, the planks of the bridge. So, you know, was it also giving off light? And if it was, and that would make sense that it wasn't actually light that it was giving off." You know, could it have been a reflection? But then if it was a reflection, it had to be light to begin with. So you go back and forth and you think, well, these poles of light, I mean, they were probably, um, I don't know, maybe, uh, you know, as round as a tire. And they were very, boom. Mm -hmm. And they then they either went up or just dissolved and the thing rose. So you said people, the thing, you're talking about the craft or the other, or the, um, the balls of light. The craft, those two... What rose after the two spikes went down? Oh, the the light, the the sphere. Okay. Yeah, yeah. People the heard heard the orange one never moved. That I remember. People and who hear this might might be thinking to themselves. So uh, there was an uh, an alien spacecraft. You were abducted by aliens. If somebody thinks that, do you think they're right to think that? Or no. Should they be thinking something else. No, I've never once said I was abducted by aliens. You know, I, we, we encountered something, we were part of something, um, surreal, something, uh, and I, in some ways I feel like it was a privilege to see what I did. It changed my views on a lot of things. Um, you know, I've always, uh, I've lost my faith if that makes any sense. Um, I don't think that, you know, I think that we all come from, uh, you know, we're all part of a bigger picture. You know, I think that, uh, we have, but 8 million species on this planet, you know, they're coming from somewhere. Um, to me, earth is our galaxy's arc and we're made up of a lot of different species from a lot of different places. And maybe there's, you know, with the tainted water, maybe there's a reason that, you know, Hey, you know, nobody's going to survive with tainted water. Right. So there, maybe there's an interest in that. Maybe there was something, um, life that was being taken somewhere else. Maybe there was life that was bringing brought down. I don't know. Um, but, you know, to, uh, I, there was definitely, um, seemed to be some type of, there was definitely an interest, whether it was a mining interest of some kind, but there, I think that we were at the wrong place at the wrong time and, and, uh, we were affected by this and, um, you know, uh, whether government was there too and, and extracting us from a vehicle because we were hit by something. Um, and maybe that's where we were. And maybe there was a mixture of government working with some, you know, some species. I don't know. Maybe there was a, I Let me ask you this. Do you, do you think you feel that way because you saw that and, and somehow were given that information, but, but it's just kind of stuck back there and that's what that feeling is? Um, because that's pretty clear. I, I've got a lot of ideas and thoughts, right? And I wonder where they come from because they're not like other people that I talk to, which is why I keep some distance in the, in the field to begin with. I, um, yeah, I, I um, God, that's, I'll tell you, after this happened, I'm going to answer this. I'm going to answer that by, by explaining something. After that happened, my mother had a stable. On our, on, it's still there to this day. And I used to sit on top of the stable, and I would just look out and, and think to myself, you know, I'd look at the, you know, the skies. I would look as far as I could in the distance. I was, felt like I was uh, off my path, you know, that I was meant for something else. I didn't belong there. Um, that... I mean, this kind of like separated me from the other kids too, because I, 
didn't want to throw the ball around and I wasn't interested in that anymore. You know, um, you know, I, I was very, uh, recluse and, you know, I kind of stayed to myself a little bit, you know, and, um, they wanted my camera and swore I was going to get a picture of it if this happened again. And we were also very, um, you know, uh, felt to some, uh, scrutiny and, and, and that kind of thing at the diner. So we were outsiders to begin with, you know, and, um, it was difficult. My mom was single, a single mom at the time. And, um, you know, she certainly couldn't defend herself against a 250 pound drunk redneck and suspenders. Right. So it got kind of tough, you know? Um, and so we kind of shut up about it, but then again, it was kind of like, well, you get your hair cut, right? You, the person cutting your hair knows more about you than anyone else. And, and so when there's only a handful of people in there, you start talking about what happened again. And of course, reports were coming over the radio. So our, our diner became very uh, known for the known for what happened. And, and as much as we, at the time, tried to stop talking about it because it wasn't doing anybody any good, you couldn't really, it was, like I said before, you can't, you can't jump into this with one foot, right? So the damage was done, for lack of a better word. And so you had to talk about it. You had to try to clear thing, you know, clarify but um, you can't clarify something when you don't really know what happened, you know? And so uh, it's been troubling, you know, it's been tough, you know? Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I look at the fact we're making some form of modern day history. And for that, I think there's, um, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, uh, we feel, you know, uh, you know, with the documents that we've got from the state and everything that uh, we've gone further than most people. And um, a lot of other people in town are able to talk about it and, and um, not feel so uh, victimized by it or scrutinized. You know, there's a park there. I mean, for us, that's, for me, that's, that's enough. You know, I do think I need to write a book to preserve what happened. Um, but then again, I get to parts where I don't know what to write because I don't know what really happened, um, if that makes sense. So I, I, I get caught up with that. And I don't want to fill in the blanks, you know, um, but um, I can say in all certainly we were, we were removed from the car. Um, we were taken somewhere. Um, you know, it, uh, we were there for hours. Um, who took us from the car? I don't know. Um, the car was running when we stopped. It was off when we got in it. My mother and grandmother were reversed. Um, you know, uh, yeah. We, we we saw stuff I can't, you know, for the life of me make sense of, you know. So uh, it is what it is, I guess. Yeah. But Tom, is there? I mean, you've told the story a lot, a lot of times. So I know it's it, it probably never gets less stressful. But is there anything else? Is there anything that we haven't heard, or somebody else may not have heard that you want to share? I mean, just. Um. <clears throat> God, uh, well, yeah, I, I guess the, uh, you know, looking at the positives, you know, looking what this has done for the topic, I guess, um, you know, we, uh, we've gotten two letters from the historical society, you know, we were inducted in the history in the state of Massachusetts. Um, you know, we've got two citations from the governor. There is the here's something that um, this has to do with with where we stand or what we feel how, how we feel that we've at least uh, gotten to a point where um, you know this wasn't for nothing you know uh, the case did go to the UN it did get mentioned at the United Nations in support of 33 426 and there's a display in the Roswell Museum about that part of it um, we were approached by an attorney in Manchester Connecticut his name was Robert Butchman and uh, he was working with MUFON at the time. I had no idea what MUFON was. And this was in the late 80s. And um, he was the public relations director and uh, was working with Muhammad Rabin, the president of the Parapsychology Society. And, um, you know, they were uh, looking at the uh, Hudson River Valley case. And uh, because of Housatonic uh, crafts or the Housatonic River were also over water, there was a connection there. My dad was a, a lawyer and a politician or a mayor at the time, acting mayor. And, um, and so he was like, well, would you mind if we mentioned your case in conjunction with um, this particular Hudson River Valley case to show some, you know, that uh, you're, uh, you know, you're not in lawn care or vehicle maintenance. You know, you have some, you know, it would be nice to mention your, your you know, your credentials. And, um, of course, about, uh, 
12 years later, he lost his life on the same date, October 7th. That the, and that was something that really uh, fueled interest with the Historical Society and some other people in the area to pay tribute back to him by looking at this further. And that's kind of how the whole thing snowballed and got to the point where it was. Um, that part of it's always lost, you know. So for me, when the monument was unveiled and the whole thing, I dedicated the day to my late father. And, um, and now it's more like, hey, we've got a tour spot now. Let's move the monument out and, you know, we could put our hot dog wagons in there. And, and you've got all these other people running around saying, well, I saw it too, you know. And I got hit by a light. And, um, you know, the whole thing just gets turned on its head. You know, it gets turned into a circus. When in fact it wasn't an easy thing to go through, you know, we've been talking about this for our whole lives and um, we feel like we've gotten somewhere and we don't want to, we're not going to get dismantled, you know, over, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, the hurdles we've had to overcome, you know, but it's made up for a strong family. You know, we've got a very strong family. Would you know? So Tom, yeah. Tom, if I would imagine it's an emotional soup that whole night. What, what would you tell me you felt like throughout the night? I mean, I, I doubt you had one feeling, but if you had one, that's okay too. What did you feel like that night? Inspired in some respects. Um, you know, I, I remember just being completely still and just, you know, um, awestruck i don't remember feeling sick or happy i just emotionless maybe just kind of um kind of like my god you know i mean that's what it was like um i wasn't scared of anything um I might, maybe i was too too young to be scared i don't know but i wasn't scared at all i um i was more uh intrigued um I uh, I remember I remember seeing a thing just kind of stay still, and then moved it. Look for one, you know. It actually, I, re I remember at one point the lowering, um, but uh, I mean it was it was it was like a bubble, you know. If you like you blow a bubble as a kid, you know. Those little bubbles, that's what it looked like, a bubble with a light. It was like, like a two-watt bulb, and it was solid. It was like a sphere. And this is the thing, too. It didn't, like, bleed light off the, the, the piece itself. It was like, almost like if you, if you had a perfectly round light bulb, and, and it was just bright and intense and self-contained, you know? Like, if it was looking at it, you could almost look like a moon, if you know what I mean. Not that it's given off light, that it's just self-contained that way. I mean, you know, there's, I've thought back and gone, yeah, it could have looked like a moon, you know, um, that locked in, 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 in that contained, you know, way. Uh, so it, it wasn't, uh, you know, like a sloppy type of mix of light and, and whatever. It was very uh, definitive. It was very. Chase, I know uh, you've looked like you've had something you wanted to ask a couple of times. What do you What do you got? Yeah, thanks, Scott, and and Tom. Thanks for doing this. By the way, this is something a lot of people would absolutely refuse to do, and I think there's a, there's going to be a lot of people that really appreciate it, and especially coming on a show like this or coming yeah. on our channel, whatever it's called. Uh, is is incredible of you so i just wanted to say i appreciate it to begin with well, thank you thank you very much thanks for having me our pleasure for okay. sure and uh I, I wanted to ask you're pretty close to a lot of these horses that that were on your property when you were nine yeah i wrote them a lot of them did they did they treat you differently after everything happened okay um I'll let my mom answer that one, <laughs> okay? <laughs> if that's okay, um, she's down here. Um, but I, I've always had a unique, that's a really good question. Not so much with the horses, although there was one incident with the horse where my, my, my brother, I, I'll tell you, my brother um, was on a horse, lost the reins and the thing was going at a full gallop 
and he was probably he was like six and it was going to fall off and i ran right in front of the horse and put my hands up and it just stopped in its tracks um not long after that i had a raccoon come up to me in my family uh, on our near our carriage house totally wild uh, wild raccoon wild raccoon and it came in the house and sat near the fireplace and i feed it once in a while, go back out the carriage house. Uh, our neighbor eventually shot it because it was eating his corn. So that was, again, you know, uh, you know so. But, uh, hey, go, go, would you mind if we met your mother? Mom, you okay? Yeah. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. All right. Hello. Hey. How are you? How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm Scott. Chase. Chase. Oh, Scott, your name's on there. Okay, yes. Okay. Scott. There's Mark. Mark, good to meet you. Greg, good to meet you. There's Greg. We talked on the phone earlier. Oh, did we? Okay. Yes, I know we talked. I didn't know who. Yes. Yeah, I'm the guy. Wow. You look, ju- you look, and I'm sure your son says this, you look just as pretty on this as you did in the, in the oh. uh, Netflix special. Oh, you just made my day. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Wait. You you were you were my when I saw you on the show I I was I just said we got to talk to these people because your your everything was just right on spot on everything you said. I don't know what I could possibly add that Thomas hasn't covered unless you have something you wanted to like to ask me um, like after the after the incident or something like that which I probably could answer better than Thomas. I I heard you yeah yeah, yeah I heard that yes so. Uh, if I could ask you a question, while while Tom has given us lots of details, he had a nine-year-old memory, but you were not nine. Could you tell us just what you saw, just five minutes, just what you saw personally, because I think you were edited a lot in the other. You mean with the incident? Yes, ma'am, with the incident. Oh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, everything Tom told you was exactly right. I mean, uh, I know I heard you ask him, um, you know, what did you say when you saw this and all that kind of thing? And actually it was, I have a little different spin on it in a way that I really believe we were privileged to experience something that it was a phenomenon. And I don't look at it as necessarily a negative. It was at the time, it was awe-inspiring. It was, uh, uh, let me say, um, jaw-dropping when you see something like that. But I also think that we were fortunate enough like with a lot of other people to be in the right place at the right time to actually see something that very few people actually have the opportunity to experience. And um, so as, as um, disturbing as it was at the time, um, um, I uh, feel that in hindsight, which is always not always the best way to look at things, but in hindsight, uh, I think that we were um, fortunate along with about, several hundred other people who had an experience also. We weren't the only people. Um, but I think um, it's something that has stayed with us for a long time. Uh, it's 51 years old, actually, uh, when that's remarkable when you think about it. But I also wanted to add that um, I give Thomas all the credit in the world for spearheading this thing to come into light again because all the people that are still remaining that were uh, living in the town at that area uh, had had to keep quiet all this time. And when he went back and revisited it, uh, all of a sudden, now they're coming out of the woodwork or closet, if you as, as it were, uh, and talking about their experiences. And in lieu of the news lately, and we see that now the government's going to release a lot of things that have been hush-hush for 50 plus years, I think, uh, it uh, gives it a lot more credibility and a lot of skeptics, I think, are thinking twice about it, quite frankly, as to the genuineness of it. Chase, did, did your questions, were they, did you have some? A couple of questions for Tom, but I also wanted to ask you, did you have a similar experience of, of traveling to, to another place? I'm sorry, did I what? Here. I think he's asking for your mom about the experience oh. traveling. Yes. Oh, oh no, actually, um, this is why I, I don't add a whole lot to what Tom has already told you, uh, because once the car lit up, <laughs> um, I have very little memory till we got to Silks. That's, that's my next memory. And so, no, I don't have that 
experience of traveling at all. If I did, I have absolutely no memory of it. On the other hand, um, I, I don't think I probably did. <laughs> I, I don't really know. Um, uh, well, what about when it when it first started? When you all got into the bridge, when the whole thing started? What is what is your your side? What you explain it to us this time? Well, we heard uh, Tom's version. Let's hear your. We'd love to hear your version of it. Well, I really, as I said, Tom explained everything beautifully. But the thing I think I remember the, the most at the very beginning of the uh, incident was the bridge and the lights flashing through the slats in the bridge. I remember that very well. The sort of a a heads up, something's coming, you know. Yeah. Um, the um, uh, I remember the lights. I remember the, the uh, seeing the ship actually, um, and Tom described that very accurately. By the way, I how the, how I, would you you describe it? You tell us what you saw. It was a turtle shaped type of thing with a middle band around it. There were lights under it. Um, it was huge. Um, how big would you say huge was? I'm not really good at this. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I remember it being big when I was really young. So. Oh, I would say <laughs> like a, a, a football field. Did you go with that? It's kind of a, I think it's kind of would you not, say it's it would fit in a Dollar General or it would fit in like a Walmart <laughs> Super Center? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, who's Dollar General? <laughs> um, probably Walmart. I, I think it was easily that that size i would have to go with that over the dollar general here um, wow. um and uh, i remember the dead silence i mean that was you know recently not too long ago what was it two or three years ago we had the full eclipse mm -hmm. uh, okay well i remember we were uh, all together watching the eclipse and just as the sun and moon kind of collided covered each other i should say uh everything was quiet there wasn't a sound, there wasn't a chirp, there wasn't a cricket, there wasn't a, any sound whatsoever. And then once it passed over, it came again. It was that's a great analogy. amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, and I think that's thrilling. I don't say that's frightening. I think that's thrilling. Well, that's I really do. And um, that's, that's, I remember that vividly. And then, you know, next, I don't remember after that. I, I was out. Do you remember any smells or? No, I don't. I do not remember any smells at all. Any uh, sounds? Uh, other than sound of nature, because this is a tremendously rural area. So, I mean, just the normal sounds you would hear on a hot summer night. Did you see the rods as well that Tom was talking about? Yes. Yes, I did. And where did those go? Just into the ground and stay, or what happened to those? Oh, God, I don't know. I'm trying to think 51 years back. Um, God, I don't know how many of this. I just saw it for a moment and like it disappeared again, but you were also driving. So I, don't know. I was busy driving, that's true. And I was also, um, you're, it's so hard to take it all in when you're looking at something <laughs> that's yeah. off world, if you want to call it that. Um, um, well, did the car stop when you were driving or did you stop the car in the bridge? I stopped the car, but I, I didn't shut it off. That I remember. I pulled why, over to the side. Why did you do that? I wanted, because things were happening and I was a little rattled and I wanted to pull off to the side and actually see, believe what I was, you know, visit, seeing actually, you know. Kind so of you thing. saw that and then you pulled over? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, but do you remember the light coming in the car? Oh yeah. That I remember very well. What that were you? Did, it was like an a, a, um, explosion inside the car of light. And it was awe-inspiring, and I, that's when I lost it. I don't remember anything. Else. That's the last memory I have, actually. Well, remember when you were talking about how it sounded like things got tight? How it felt like you were? Uh, Tom said underwater, but you said it got kind of the the I guess the atmosphere. You'd say it got kind of weird, like you're like like you're underwater. Would, would, did you try to talk during that, or was anybody talking during that to you? Or no, I think we were just fixated on what was going on around us at the time. In fact, I know we were. Yeah, no so with, with the boys in the back, were you turning around trying to see what they were doing? Were you worried about them or were you, did you, were they yelling or making any noise at all? No, actually not. And uh, the things that happened after the bridge happened rather rapidly. So you didn't have a chance to turn around. You had to, you were reacting rather than uh, you're reacting to the situation. 
and I didn't have time to even turn around and say, are you okay? I was sure they were going to be, I guess, but uh, no, I didn't. Um, Did you have any feeling that you needed to do something or you wanted to do and buy something, anything like you needed to leave or you needed to go somewhere or you needed or didn't feel like something was that you had the feeling you needed to do something or something was telling you to do something or go somewhere? I, I just was in the moment at the time and I wanted to observe and experience it. I mean, I, I wasn't afraid. I, the fear wasn't in it at all. And to this day, um, I, when I think back about it, I, I don't think we were in harm's way, actually. But we were experiencing something that was very unusual, at, to say why the least. Do you, why do you feel like you weren't in harm's way? What makes you feel like that now? Because we weren't really harmed. <laughs> we weren't harmed, actually. I mean, whatever the, it was, and we're probably be a long time before we ever really know what really it was. Mm -hmm. um, nobody was injured. Uh, no, nothing was destroyed. Not even the landscape wasn't destroyed. So uh, um, I think my feeling was correct that we weren't in harm's way at all. But it was frightening at the time, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I think for several days afterwards, we probably pinched ourselves to, to try to find out whether we really were dreaming yeah. or what. But and that wasn't the case, of course. But I mean, it was, um, uh, you kind of walked around in a little, little bit of a daze, I guess is as close as I could come to it, uh, mentally. I mean, it was. Um, did you get the feeling that you saw a spaceship? Or, or did you? Yes, I did. And actually, I believe I have seen two UFOs since then, um, one in Louisiana and one in Florida. And I was with other people at the same time. Not this kind of a, uh, encounter, but I do remember looking up and everybody was saying, wow, what is that? And it was uh, there one minute and took off the next. And so, and you have to remember, UFOs, Oh, it's only unidentified flying object. It doesn't necessarily mean something weird, you know? So I'm not afraid to use the phrase. A lot of people are, but I'm not. Yeah. I mean, to me, it just it covers it. Did, did, you have a, did, did you have a similar experience with religion where you, you started to doubt what was actually going on like Tom did? Uh, with religion? No. Yes, um, ma'am. I don't. I believe that we make creation much too small. We try to make everything reduced down to something that we can understand. And I think it's much larger than that. I think uh, just with the galaxies and everything that we we're being discovered almost on a daily basis, practically. Uh, I don't at all. Um, I think we make, uh, uh, we limit what the creation actually is. I think it's much larger and bigger and more wonderful than we probably uh, know. Really, Have I you think. always felt that way? Excuse me? Have you always felt that way or is this yes, something? Yes, I have. I have. Um, uh, uh, and this just magnified it a little bit, I guess. But um, I hate to break in like this, but if I don't go take a pee. <laughs> I might so, I really understand. Let's, let's, let's break for five minutes. Yeah, let's, yeah. Just, let's yeah. literally come back and let's just leave everything on and come back in five minutes. Okay. okay. That works for me. Thank you. I need. Okay, I'm, great. I'm just going to go on mute. So has this whole thing been weird for you? Oh, a little bit. Um, I, I'm one of the people actually that didn't speak up about a lot of things. So, yeah. you know, uh, I'm here to support Thomas and his efforts, and uh, for history at this point. At, at 81 years mm. <laughs> at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but um. Um. This is only the second time I've spoken about it um, in, in the media. Although I did mm. work for a radio station for years, so I should be used to it, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. What was, it, what was the, with all that going on, what was the part that scared you? Was there anything that actually scared you about all that? When it, I really don't think, think I was ever scared. I think I was just overwhelmed, um, awe it struck, basically. I really don't think I was ever afraid. I'm not sure anybody in my family was at that point, to be mm. honest with you. Um, when something like that, you don't have time to get scared, probably. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. you know that kind of thing. So. 
Um, Do you, is there one part that you always think about when you think about it? Do you ever wake up and go, wow, I remember that part of it or just something, anything that recurs? Or? The, the bridge and the lights coming through the slats in the bridge. I, I always remember that. But I'm also a covered bridge fan, so <laughs> I yeah. would. But I That's love good. It. That's good. Yeah. I'm glad we can cut a little bit. I think this was in the shot when I sat down. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we're, we're all show up top as well. <laughs> I got yeah. that, yeah. I think we're all wearing shorts. Look at Mark. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Any good any well, good news actually, actually, that's what they do on the five, which I do watch. Exactly. <laughs> that's true. All, all news. I've been on CNN, and you're sitting across the table from a guy in a great coat and all that. And you look down, and <laughs> jeans or something else. So Chase, Chase, excuse me. I'm sorry, Chase. Yeah. What were you going to ask? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for coming on. And we were hoping if we could, we could just ask Tom uh, two or three questions and we'll, we'll wrap this thing. Okay. Let me give him back to the chair. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, for being right. with thank us. Thank you so much. So much. Yeah, good great to meet you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. So what do you, what do you got? Uh, so Tom, I just wanted to follow up. Uh, I didn't get, I didn't get to ask you very much tonight, uh, yeah. but again, I appreciate you coming on. And I think there's going to be, there's going to be, I don't think it's a stretch to say millions of people who appreciate you doing this for everybody and, and just having the balls to come, come on the show, especially facing four behavior profilers at the same time, which would give most people a, a heart attack. I think I'm all right. Uh, I yeah. mean, just the first time I talked to Greg Hartley on the phone, I was nervous. So, and I, I was, was too. <laughs> so, but I wanted, I, I wanted to say thanks and, and just maybe yeah. give you a, a follow-up question or two here. Yeah, yeah, please. You know, absolutely. When, when you were nine, we talked about how the horses started, you know, that there was something that, that, that changed or something that was, that was different for you there uh, with, with the animals. And I wanted to ask like, who was your, who was one of your good friends when you were nine, like a neighbor or somebody you hang, hung out with a lot? Well, to be honest with you, it was uh, probably the the uh, Linda Farrell, who lived upstairs over our diner, who I uh, miraculously just ran into about a year ago, and she contacted me on Facebook, um, and she remembered everything because it, the the stuff that came over the radio, she'd be in the diner, and and um, as far as good friends back then, yeah, um, two twins, Joe and Steve Hosier, were very good friends of mine. Um, one of them was found drowned at Lake Mansfield. Um, you know, it was a, a lot, I don't know what the hell's going on over there. Um, and then of course, uh, the girls I walked to school with, you know, who lived on my street, uh, Gina and Marisa Paul, uh, Marissa Paul. Um, I still stay in touch with them to this day. They were witnesses to this thing. They also gave testimony. They were big horse people. Um, they had snowmobiles. We used to bomb around in the snowmobiles back in the day. Uh, you were able to keep those relationships with the people you were already very close to. You had some, some run-ins outside of that, but the, those relationships stuck really close and it was, they stayed pretty much close to you. Well, if it's made in, in, in Great Barrington, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was uh, the heirs. Actually, there's three um, family members. The last name is heirs and um, they were witnesses. They could have been on the show too, but they, they didn't have them on it either. There was a lot more witnesses that didn't get on that show. There's a judge, Kevin Titus, who actually sealed the documents. Um, he was actually shot for the show. They cut him. Um, so I don't really know what happened there. I mean, there were so many other people that could have added something. And take take the binder. The binder, they showed the Great Barrington binder, the officer opening up the binder. Yep. And say, oh, there were only two incidences. And one of them was uh, uh, the garbage or something, right? I, I Beer cans. Bear cans, okay. Yeah. Well, this was a holiday weekend with people drinking and over, and all the the, the police department was getting calls, WSBS was getting calls, and there was no page in the binder. But does that uh, strike you as a little bit odd? I mean, all they had to do was click the binder, take the page out, and shut it for the show or whatever, or or they was never put in there to begin with. But that to me was like, are you kidding me? And then even Sheffield's um, Galata's father had gone out looking for uh, with the, with Eddie, his son, to 
see if they could spot something. That's how much it drove the Sheffield Police Department to go look for something. And yet the bigger town, three miles down the road, only had something in there about beer cans. Come on. But uh, the episode as a whole, I think, did a lot of good. Um, it, it's, um, it's not just a, another UFO story. This is beyond that. And it's I, an experience story. It, it's, yeah. And it's, lots of people. And it's documented. It's documented. So, Tom, the only other question I wanted to ask you is, you know, with everything that, that's coming out, this is a, something that lots of people saw. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the governor's verified this. It's been verified by the Historical Society. There's, there's just a m mass amount of evidence here to support all this stuff. And I can tell you... I, I have probably haven't been doing this as long as Greg, but I've been doing this a long time. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to ask you, is there something that maybe happened during your experience when you're outside the car and you don't have to, you don't have to say what it is, but is there something that you still don't feel comfortable talking about? Absolutely. It looked, it looked to me that way. No question. Okay. And the reason I, I don't want to go there is because right now uh, we have the support of the governor. I have the support of the lieutenant governor. We have the support of historians, judges, bankers. Um, and I have a responsibility to them too, not to make them look silly. And um, I have uh, agreed to that, if that makes sense. Sure. And, and I respect that. You know, my father was um, – in office and um, if someone said hey listen we're gonna go out on a limb for you you know we're gonna go the extra mile we know this happened um, your family was you know, key in this and um, you know we are gonna vote on this thing and um, if you know one of the questions that they have or concerns that they have is how are you going to handle it afterwards you know do we have your God's honest truth you know, would you mind signing something for us that you will not uh, use verbiage? You will not um, you know, handle this in a way that, um, you know, we feel it needs to be in a, a more grounded fashion. And if you'll agree to do that, then, um, you know, I think we can get this thing pushed through. And so for me to start um, going down a path or, or being too particular over things that but at the end of the day it doesn't really matter, you know, um, yeah, I'm not going to betray their trust, and I, and uh, you know, I gave them my word. I've signed something saying, I'll, you know, I'll handle things a certain, you know, I won't go too far. Uh, but yes, there are lots of things I remember that I, I, and I, and again, I, I, I struggle with that part of it anyway, you know, uh, and and that's probably the one area that I, I'm more confused about. So I have mixed feelings about it. I'm conflicted. Um, I, I know what happened. You know, my brother remembers it too. Um, my brother had a club foot, by the way. He had a brace on his right foot. And he remembers attention being put to his club foot. Why? I don't know. Um, so there's little things like that. Um, that, uh, you know, you know that, uh, do I want to talk about it? Yeah, you know, probably. But is it necessary? No. You know, not at the end of the day. Scott, you're on mute. Oh. So what if I stopped recording? Would you tell us about it? Because you can see where it says recording yeah. up there when I stop. And hand to God, I promise you on video, we won't, we won't release. That we that. won't do anything with that. I just want to know what the hell happened. Me too. Holy I'm shit. just like on the edge. They're going, holy shit. Because as soon as if we got off of here, they're going to go, what the hell? So yeah. I'm going to stop recording. So if you just feel like it, you can. If I do start, I'll, I'll, you'll know yep. if I was just starting. And we can, we can give Tom a preview of what we're going to do in the after show when we analyze this <laughs> right now. If hey, it's your, you know, I, I, uh, I agree to a, you, whatever you guys want to honor, however you want to. Okay. You know, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I mean, that's up to you. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to stop recording. So. Yep. If you, so if you'll tell us about it, I'll, hand to God, I won't record this. No, we promise you that. Will that, will that chuck us out of the... Um, no, not... Here we go. 